Clearly, Jehovah wants us to be generous. Jehovah's money. Be generous. Give it now. Think about the many names in the Bible. We know whose name occurs the most often. Jehovah's name. I'd like a little audience participation. Whose name occurs the second most prominent time? Okay, our dear brother. Israel? No. Whose name appears the second most? Uh, brother Hal? No, excuse me. No, not yet. Uh, Brother Anthony Montoya? No, it's getting hard. Uh, Probably if I tell you, it's a little embarrassing. It's Jesus Christ. I love that clip, it's just so weird. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Thank you all for coming. So, wow, did everybody watch the Leah Remini expose against uh, JW Org? I found it to be really well done. It was, thank you all, thank you, Leah, thank you, Mike Rinder. Um, it was really fantastic how they really helped to show what really goes on in the organization. Because when things happen, like let's say you are abused by your husband or you're abused by an elder or somebody in the congregation, um, when you take it to the elders and nothing generally tends to be done about it because they don't want to get themselves involved in families and they don't want you to call the police, they don't really want to do anything unless it's a second witness. Um, if you do decide to do anything and you are kicked out of the organization as a result, nobody will find out what happened. They're just going to assume that you are a wrongdoer who was unrepentant. And it is just so far from the truth. And so this show helped to, to show all of us that this isn't just a, a case of a rogue elder who did something, you know, off script. This really demonstrated that the organization is sick at every congregation, at every level, that everybody's impacted, and so many lives have been ruined through suicides and abuse and, um, you know, just stories that will just bring you to tears. And it's important to know that this is what really goes on in the organization. So I hope a lot of people were helped with this. And uh, it's not what I wanted to talk about today, though. I had, to, I had to acknowledge, though, what a fantastic show it was. But what I wanted to talk about today is are the uh, 10 reasons why JW Org is not like Jesus, why they don't listen to him, and he's not really their leader. He's like a faux leader. Okay? So have a look and see what I have to say about this, because I, I found it really interesting as I did research for this video. You know, when you look at other religions, Jesus is always the focal point, it seems. And they talk about how it's the grace of God and the grace of Christ that we even have the opportunity for everlasting life and that we don't have to earn it. But J.W. York isn't quite like that. I know that when I was a witness, I never felt that Jesus was the focal point of the organization. I do even soften that clip that I just showed you. So clearly I wasn't alone in feeling that way. And... Um, it, there definitely was a feeling that you had to put in your time sheets. <laughs> you know, they would say, okay, you don't have to earn it, but, but go out and do this for us, recruit people. So recruiting and preaching seem to be the focal points, at least when I was a member. And it seems nothing has changed, let's face it. So it's sort of a strange thing. And the relationship they even have with Jesus is weird. While on the one hand, they have a form of godly devotion and that they claim that Jesus is their leader, there's this strange kind of almost a passive aggressiveness they have with him where it's like they are trying to insert the governing body where Jesus rightfully belongs. It's a, it sounds strange. I know you're probably thinking, well, what is she talking about? But you know what? Have a look at their own publications that I'm going to show you in this little presentation and um, draw your own conclusion. So this first reference here is from the November 15th, 1979 Watchtower. The first point there is interesting. They really try to make the point that Jesus is not our Savior, but God is. 
So that's kind of interesting. You see, it's, it's what I highlighted there, the first sentence. And then they quote the scripture there from 1 Timothy chapter 2, 5 and 6, where it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men. Not all men. Put in brackets. See, I highlighted that. A man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a corresponding ransom for all. But isn't it interesting that they added to the scripture there? At least they put it in brackets so we can see that they added it. But they're obviously trying to make the point that, that although Jesus is the mediator for men, it's not for you. <laughs> and then the last thing I highlighted there um, is completely off topic, but I just wanted people to have a look when they have a spare moment. This next slide is from an older publication that, the, that JW Org had. And I've shown it in other videos, a few actually. But again, we're reading that scripture in 1 Timothy. And here they try to emphasize their belief that Jesus is only the mediator for them, not for you. That is, those of the anointed class. Most witnesses have no idea that J.W. Org teaches this. Because if you were to ask pretty much any Jehovah's Witness if Jesus is their mediator, see what they'd say. I remember our book study conductor asking us this question, and we were all clueless when he said that Jesus was not our mediator. So this is not a biblical teaching, and it does not follow what Jesus said. It's something that J.W. Org made up, because the Bible does not talk about two classes of people. And when it ever did discuss two different types of people, it was talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and how they would all become one. It was not talking about a heavenly class and an earthly class. This is something that they clearly made up. Jesus never mentioned anything about the requirement to join an organization. He also never mentioned a governing body. Do you know how many times the word organization and the words governing body are in the Bible? Never. <laughs> They're never found in the Bible. So it's clearly not a big deal to God, either of those two things. Yet they're a huge big deal to JW Org. If you do a search on their DVD for the word organization, you will find it eight, almost 18,000 times. And if you do a search for the words governing body, you'll find it's almost 7,000 times. The Bible says that we can receive everlasting life through Jesus, not through an organization. Yet, what does JW Org say? Have a look. So from the February 15th, 1983 Watchtower, they said, to receive everlasting life in the earthly paradise, we must identify that organization and serve God as part of it. They're not quoting from the Bible, they're quoting from their own literature where they say that we have to be part of this organization to receive life. But that is not what the Bible says. It never says such a thing. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 says, Obtain the salvation that is in union with Christ Jesus, along with everlasting glory. And that for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, in order that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed, but have everlasting life. He that exercises faith in the Son has everlasting life. Not anything is it, does it ever say about joining an organization? And check out some of these absolutely insane quotes from their own literature. From the 2010 September 15th Watchtower, the anointed and their other sheep companions recognize that by following the lead of G, no, the modern day governing body, they are in fact following their leader Christ. Really, is that what the Bible says? No, it does not say that. We need to obey the faithful and discreet slave to have Jehovah's approval. That's from the 2011 Watchtower. Does the Bible say that? No. And the other quote there from the 2009 Watchtower, since Jehovah God and Jesus Christ completely trust the faithful and discreet slave, should we not do the same? They don't. It never says that. That's what they say and what they want you to believe. So that you could in fact worship them. Jesus never encouraged children to be baptized. In fact, he himself wasn't baptized until he was about 30. He certainly could have gotten baptized at 12, as he was on par with the religious leaders of his day. So he had the knowledge, and for sure he had the love. But he didn't get baptized. Yet J.W. Org totally encourages it. This quote here is from the 1988 Watchtower, March 15th, as you can see. It's talking about a preteen son, so he's got to be at the very oldest 12. 
and he really wanted to get baptized. So the father set him up with the three elders and they felt that he did, yes, in fact, qualify. And then they talked about this uh, 10-year-old girl who was attending Pioneer School. 10-year-old baptized girl attending Pioneer School. They're trying to portray the fact that it's quite normal to be this young and to get baptized. But it's not at all what Jesus did. And there's not even one instance of a child getting baptized in the Bible. So what's up with that? The fact is that children who get baptized are not able to do what the Bereans did. And that is investigate it. What if a child wanted to go to another church? What if they said, Dad, I want to go to the Mormon church or a Catholic church today, just to see how it's done in other religions? There's no way a parent would allow that to happen. Or what if he said, I want to look at the Ray Franz book? There's no way a parent would buy that book for the child. I mean, they wouldn't even allow it into their home. But you see, if you're studying, if you're an adult and you're studying with the witnesses, who's going to stop you? You don't have a parent that's going to say, no, that book's not coming into the house. Or no, you're not allowed to go to that church. You're allowed to do the proper investigations that a person should do when they're making a lifelong contract to an organization. And the thing is, is that children, if they, when they do grow up and when, if they should wake up, they're given the same punishments as an adult. Namely, that they're going to lose all their friends and their family and their good reputation. Even though they never really had much of a choice, did they? They were coerced into, into doing this. And they didn't really have a chance to properly investigate it. The organization wants children to get baptized. It's not the Bible that says it. It never, as I said, it doesn't say it even once. But the organization knows it's a captive organization. And they know that once they've got you, it's very difficult to get out. Like I said, not without losing everything you have. So they encourage this to happen, but it's not what God or Jesus encourage. Jesus broke one of the Ten Commandments to save a life. He demonstrated that life is sacred. JW Org punishes members who try to do this. Like the Pharisees who obey the letter of the law, but miss the entire point of the law, the organization claims to follow the Bible, yet medical procedures involving blood are never mentioned in the Bible. Life is sacred to be saved, even if it means breaking one of God's laws. Jesus showed that. And he did this for an animal. And he would have done the same for a human, of course. Perhaps he would have broken two laws <laughs> to save the life of a human. JW Org doesn't care though if you die while obeying their policies. Martyrs are great for the organization. Jesus did not shun, and he never taught his followers to shun either. He did talk about an illustration that was called, that we refer to as the prodigal son. It's not referred to as a prodigal shun. It's an excellent illustration to show the love that a father has for his child. That even though the child may not want to join his organization or not agree with him at that level, because we know that there was no indication from what, the, from what Jesus said in this illustration that the child was returning to this organization. He was returning to his father because he was hungry. And the father saw him from far away and welcomed him back. And that's the illustration Jesus wants to show us, not to shun. And have a look at some of these other verses and to see how did Jesus treat people that JW Org today would shun. I found this information from JW Facts. He's showing here the scripture at Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. And it's a standard of how Christians are to treat wrongdoers. There's various steps, as we can see, from the scripture at Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, when somebody commits a sin. The final step is that if he doesn't even listen to the congregation, let him be too just as a man of the nations and as a tax collector. Well, how did Jesus treat these individuals? How did he treat tax collectors? Well, he spoke with them. He even ate with them. He certainly didn't shun them. And he spoke constantly to the scribes and the Pharisees, whom he, he strongly condemned them, but it didn't stop him from talking to them. He certainly didn't shun them or avoid them. He even allowed the Pharisee Nicodemus to visit with him to have a Bible discussion. That's a massive no-no to J.W. Org. 
and again how they're not at all like Jesus. Jesus even spoke directly to the original apostate, Satan. Jesus repeatedly said not to judge. In fact, he said that the defining measure of a true Christian is one that not just loves their friends, but somebody who can love their enemies. That really stands out, because that's not easy to do. Childish name-calling, like worldly or apostates, are not examples of loving your enemies. Rather, it's examples of bullying, and it really shows their contempt for anybody who is brave enough to stand up to JW Org. Jesus never used the name Jehovah. He never once called his Heavenly Father by his name. And that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, who calls their father by his first name? I was taught that that was very disrespectful to do. But JW Org throws it around like it's some kind of a good luck charm. Jehovah this, Jehovah that. And yet, oddly enough, the governing body admits that this isn't even the proper pronunciation. It's something more like Yahweh. Check it out. Some scholars feel that the original pronunciation was closer to Yahweh rather than Jehovah. Just how important is the exact pronunciation of the original Hebrew name? Could we get sidetracked by trying to determine what that pronunciation was? Well, first of all, let's establish why we use the pronunciation Jehovah in English. Is it because the closest, it's the closest pronunciation to the original? No. We use the name Jehovah because it's widely recognized in English. Jesus never kept track of his time. There also weren't titles within the congregation for Jesus' followers, like Pioneer. I mean, nothing is stopping a person from getting 50 or 70 or 100 hours if this is what they want to do. So why do they have the title Pioneer? I know there were some people that loved the status. They loved to say, hey, look at me, I'm a pioneer. And that comes with it, the idea that you obviously are getting 50 or 70 or whatever. I don't know what the requirement is. I think it's 70 hours a month. And that somehow makes you better than the average publisher. Well, I'm a pioneer. And I know I'll even say it. I'll say, well, I used to pioneer. And people right away will go, oh, okay, that means you had to be an exemplary publisher and you put in that many hours. So it says something about you. And it's an organization that judges your spirituality based on how many hours you put in each month. And if you put in a lot of hours, well, that enti entitles you to carry a microphone or become a ministerial servant or whatever. But for some people, it was like tooting a horn in front of themselves, which is exactly what Jesus said not to do. And it very much reminds me of this Kevin McFree video, this very talented video that, uh, that he made. Take a look. Before we conclude, we just have one happy announcement. Sister Queen Bee has been appointed to serve with the title of Regular Pioneer. So everybody now knows she does 70 hours in the field ministry. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is always portrayed with a beard. Yet, oddly enough, beards in most parts of the world, in the JW org world that is, are not allowed. Like in this picture here from the Watchtower, the March 15th, 2015. It's funny that it's called, This is the way you approved. Not with a beard, you're not. <laughs> not according to JW Org, at least. Actually, I shouldn't say that he's always portrayed as having a beard. Because there was that little stint in the 60s or 70s when he was being rebellious and shaved it off. Here's a little montage slide that I put together from the Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained book. I guess Jesus wasn't being theocratic, so they shaved off his beard for him. What was so refreshing about Jesus is that he did away with all the burdensome laws that the Israelites had on them. He said that everything hinged upon two things, loving your Heavenly Father 
and loving your neighbor. Is this what J.W. Orrick has done? Not at all. In fact, they've pretty much brought back the old laws and they've created this huge plethora of a train wreck of policies and laws that would rival easily the old law covenant. Take my yoke, it is kindly and light, and you will find refreshment for your souls. This is what Jesus said about him and about his teachings. But is this what we find in JW Org? Instead, you're gonna find, well, I know when I was a member, we estimated that about a third of our congregation and neighboring ones in our area, a third of the members were on antidepressants. Why was that? They keep saying it's this happy, wonderful organization, but Instead, we're finding people that are on antidepressants and miserable. That's, that doesn't seem normal, does it? It's like you could never do enough, though, and this is why. You felt guilty when you didn't study your watchtower. You felt guilty when you didn't go in service. Guilty that you weren't pioneering. There's always so much guilt being placed on you that you could never do enough for the organization. Check out this listing that I found on the JW Facts website. It's uh, a compilation of some of the rules of ways that you can get disfellowshipped as found in the policy book that the elders have. Why can't they leave matters in Jehovah's hands? Sadly, most times JW Org seeks to control every aspect of your life. They like to get in there like a dirty shirt and make rules where God's word was silent, like when they disfellowship members for smoking or for voting. So I did up a bonus reason why JW Org is nothing like Jesus. I couldn't leave this one out. We know that Jesus spoke of a generation that would see a sign of the end and that this generation would not pass away before they saw this sign and before the end came. Now JW Org felt that Bible prophecy pointed to the year 1914 in fulfillment of what Jesus was discussing. Then when nothing happened in 1914, they said it was, well, that actually did happen, but it was invisible. It's all very convenient. <laughs> Funny enough, they actually stole this idea from the Seventh-day Adventists. So that's kind of interesting too. It was a very convoluted explanation as to how they got to this year. They would do this day for, they, you know, they chose a scripture that talked about a day for a year, a day for a year. Then they chose another one in another part of the Bible that talked about a time and times and half a time and carry the one, you know. Uh, what does a time represent and when times means more than one. And anyways, bang, 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 it took them to 1914. It was so convoluted, though, that nobody who read the Bible would ever have come up with this idea on their own. And in fact, I remember trying to study, when I was studying with people, the only way I could explain it was using Bible study aids. Now, JW Org must realize how crazy it was that they even tried to give it validity by having Jesus make it sound like, speaking for Jesus as if this is a factual because Jesus said it. Have a look. So this is from the You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth book. Notice where I've got the arrow pointing there. It quotes that scripture in Matthew chapter 24 about the generation not passing away. And then it goes, which generation did Jesus mean? He meant the generation of people who were living in 1914. Those persons yet remaining of that generation are now very old. Hmm. Well, <laughs> where do I start? Which generation did Jesus mean? He meant, yeah. Speaking for Jesus here, how do we know he meant that? He clearly didn't, because that generation did pass away. And the next line here, that these persons are very old. Well, this book, I don't remember when it was written, but it was, let's just say it's from the mid-80s, I guess, or late 80s. And they were old back then, but they have since died. So this entire book is and teaching is completely out to lunch now. And in fact... A letter that was given to literature servants in, the con in each congregation, were, they were told to throw out this book. That's what they think <laughs> of, of publications that have wrong information like this. So I'd like to just introduce the idea that why don't Jehovah's Witnesses throw out current publications? They need to be proactive because we know that in about five years, or maybe less, JW Org is going to send out another letter saying that their current books, you know, the God's Love book or whatever, need to be thrown out because they're all full of nonsense. So when that generation died, 
JWORG had to come up with a new explanation, as we see here in the 2010 April 15th Watchtower. Again, they have to redefine what a generation means. They're saying how it usually refers to people of varying ages whose lives overlap. That's the key word. They had to get that in there during a particular time period. And then it says here, how then are we to understand Jesus' words about this generation? He evidently meant that the lives of the anointed ones were on hand when the sign began to become evident in 1914 would overlap with the lives of other anointed ones who would see the start of the Great Tribulation. Just a little bonus point to the little bonus that I'm giving you here. Whenever you see the word evidently used in JW Org publications, know that every word said after it is a total guess. <laughs> they have no they clearly have no idea what they're talking about. And just know that it's it's going to be discarded probably within about five, two to five years after this word is uttered. So as I said before, be proactive, just throw out the publication <laughs> because you know that it, within a couple years, they're gonna tell you to throw it out anyways. But I'll just give you some examples of what I mean when I say the word evidently used in their publications. Check these out. So as it says here, evidently then, this parable applies during the last days, but its climax comes during the great tribulation for now, until we change it. <laughs> In this other citation here, when Jesus said that the master of those slaves came and settled accounts, he was evidently referring to the time when he will come to execute judgment at the end of this system, or at the beginning. <laughs> and just one more reference, if you can stand it. From the August 15th, 2014, those resurrected to life in the new world will evidently not marry. Eh, maybe they will. We really don't know. Just having a little fun there. But uh, the whole point of this video is really to show though that Jesus in the Bible is portrayed as a loving and kind and compassionate person who would break a law to save a life because life was sacred, not the policy of the law, but the life itself. And um, his load was kindly and refreshing and light. Is this what you feel like when you're within JW Org? You know, can you honestly say that when you go there, you feel refreshed, that you walk away from it feeling refreshed, you know, because so many times there was, there was just so many burdens placed upon people and so many rules that people had to follow that really didn't make sense. They're not the way Jesus did things, you know, the two rules, love your father and love your neighbor, you know, instead we have rule books, you know, Anyways, there's just such a huge difference. I personally don't see how JW Org is anything like Jesus. They, in fact, try to take his place whenever they can. And then conveniently say, well, we're not inspired. Okay, <laughs> they like to have it both ways. But at any rate, this is for you to decide for yourself how you feel about this. So I hope you enjoyed this little show. And um, I will see you again very soon. Take care, bye-bye.